Aaron Hilger, you are the CEO at SMACNA, the Sheet Metal and Air Conditioning Contractors National Association. I'm so excited to chat with you today. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Jackie. I'm happy to be here. I'm so psyched to talk to you. I think you've got a lot of knowledge that I'm going to hopefully unlock while we're chatting today. But before we even get into that, I want to know, how did you get into the trades and eventually become the CEO at SMACNA? Sure. So I'll give you the medium length version, not the super long version, perhaps. But um, I had the great fortune of growing up in the construction industry. So my father and grandfather were in the roofing business. We were uh, roofing and sheet metal, primarily industrial work, a lot of uh, public work as well, union contractors. Uh, so I got to grow up doing all of those things, uh, which started at a very young age of, you know, visiting job sites in the summertime with dad or sometimes with grandpa to, you know, having your first job sweeping the warehouse floor. And I'm sure I was paid for that sort of. We'll, we'll ignore the child labor law violations there. Um, and then, you know, loading trucks, driving trucks, eventually working on crews. Uh, I did not join the union. I didn't go through the apprenticeship program, but I had a pretty good schooling in how to roof and also how to bend architectural metal. Um, I had no intention of being part of our family company. However, after college, after I worked in Washington for about a year and a half, two years, and was finishing a master's degree, I ended up being the chief operating officer of my family's business. I ran our construction operations, um, which was a great experience, taught me a lot. Uh, did that for about five or six years, and then we made a strategic decision to no longer be in the uh, unionized segment of the roofing business in upstate New York. And we, you know, dad and grandpa went in their separate ways doing their real estate and other things, and I started running associations full time. Uh, in about 2003, I took over a company called the Builders Exchange, which was a trade association formed in the 1880s uh, that had about, when I left, about 600 members. Uh, ran that and 12 other associations for almost 20 years and then took over SMACNA in January of this year. Um, ah. Two of the groups that I worked with with Builders Exchange uh, were actually SMACNA chapters. I started working with SMACNA Rochester in 2005 and SMACNA New York State in 2008. Nice. That was a perfect medium length answer. And thank you so much for giving me the background that you did work in the trades before you started doing the association. Always funny how I had no intention of working in the family business. And then you blink and you're like, wait, how did I get here? You know, and it's one of those things that happens over time, right? You know, what I found doing, you know, political and lobbying type work in Washington is that um, I already had more experience than a lot of the people I was competing with, but I may not have worked for the right campaign or worked at the right with the right individual. So I wasn't going get, to get a good job. So uh, even though, I mean, I probably could have stuck it out and I'm sure the career would have been just great. Um, I made a decision to, uh, finish my master's uh, from GW in political management and, you know, then start, you know, join the roofing business as I was doing that and got an MBA in that process because I didn't understand accounting or finance. So, you know, did a lot of different things and, you know, that was my way of collecting knowledge. I think you're actually the first guest on the show that's ever gone from politics to, uh, to trades, even though you kind of. Well, you were kind of, it was, you sandwiched a politic, a, a political career in between your trades experience and eventually. Yeah, there was the a trades. little bit of here and there, you know, I always was active politically and, you know, in upstate New York and in my role at Bill Exchange, I was certainly very influential in the, in the state politics and local politics. So, you know, that was a big focus of my work uh, for almost 20 years in Rochester and, you know, still a focus at SmackDown National. Nice. Very cool. So I want to know a little bit more about SMACNA. So recently Service Titan became a gold associate member yeah. uh, or gold associate sponsor. I want to know what differentiates SMACNA members from other contractors. Um, so I think there's a, a couple different things that we could we could touch on. And, and you know, certainly there's great contractors that are SMACNA members and, and great contractors that aren't. So I don't want to draw too broad a distinction. But to be fair, I think... You know, anybody, if you're a member of SMACNA, you're a union contractor. Um, some could say that has its pluses or minuses, but that's a business choice that our members have made. Um, that does lead to some very positive things, though. They are committed to training. They fund training. They spend the real, spend the tremendous amount of time, effort, and energy making sure we have some of the best trained guys in the business, uh, guys being men or women, workers in the business. Um, and we continually reinvest in that aspect of training. So as we talk about things like uh, ventilation verification or, you know, making sure buildings aren't sick buildings. You know, our members are experts at actually making those buildings, you know, safe and effective for our kids to go to school in and for us to go to work in every day. Um, 
I would also say that you know SmackDown is, SmackDown is a standards creating organization. You know we have a number of what I'm sure some would find riveting titles. I find them very exciting. You know things like the HVAC duct construction design manual or the architectural design manual. You know there's about 40, 50 standards that we're involved with, and our members use those to build great project projects. You know they are the design standards that you will see in spec books every single day, referenced by the design community, and we do a lot of technical education in those areas. Um, I think the other thing I would add is that, you know, while we certainly have contractors that are very small and many that are very large, um, we have a lot of specialty folks. For instance, one of the few aerospace certified contractors in the sheet metal industry in the country is a SMACTA member. Uh, that's Kathy Kerber. She's a great, great individual. Happens to be a member of SMACTA's board. Um, we also have the contractors that will be on almost all of these mega projects that are coming up in the next, you know, five to three to five years. You know, those big projects that... Ford is building, or the auto, manuf auto the auto manufacturers are building to produce batteries. Uh, the silicone uh, manufacturers are building to produce chips in the United States. Those are all projects we're going to do because we have the size and the bonding capacity and the technical skill to do them. Very cool. So leader in standards, like just general base, uh, baseline best in practice standards when it comes to all the design elements that come into all the industries that SmackNet touches training, you're breaking into these really incredible industries. Um, and you also have access to some of these mega projects like you referenced. Now I have to tell you, I don't personally don't have any trades experience. My dad was a carpenter growing up. So I kind of, I can, and I've been hosting this podcast for over a hundred episodes. So I can kind of like, I could manage a water cooler conversation, I think. But when it comes to union contractors, I am completely out of my depth. Service Titan, uh, a, a bunch of our customers early on were primarily non-union. So um, just for my, just for my um, knowledge, I would love it if you could just tell me like, in your mind, like, what do you think is the primary difference between union and non-union? Obviously, you know, there's a union, but is there anything that I should know as someone who's interviewing you and getting into the space that I should be aware of? Sure. I mean, I think the, if you look at the, if you're union or non-union, you can look at them as two different business models, right? The non-union sector, you know, doesn't have a labor partner. Um, what does that mean? That means the individual contractor is responsible for recruiting, training, finding workers, and some kinders are incredibly successful doing that. Um, the workers may or may not be portable in the sense that they may not want to move locations or work between different contractors. And that's one of the bigger, one of the bigger differences is if, if you're a union contractor, you're part of what's called the multi-employer bargaining group. Um, what that means is you could work for um, John Smith Mechanical one day uh, and then work for Dave Smith Mechanical the next day based on hiring needs and staffing needs of those individual companies. Uh, and that's a, that transfer of movement is very fluid and very easy. Um, you know, in the non-union sector, you might be working for one company, you know, and then you get laid off, get fired, whatever happens, you make a change. You've got to go find another job. That job isn't going to find you. There isn't a ready, there's a ready pool of contractors, certainly, but they aren't necessarily connected together to make that transition easy. Uh, the workers' benefits are also very different. Um, in the non in the union sector, they are multi-employer benefit plans. So that means the employees, healthcare, retirement pensions, I'm sorry, retirement pensions, annuity funds, which are typically like 401ks, are done by an ERISA trust. Um, so those benefits follow the guy. So that worker is working for John Smith one day, you know, and his health care contribution is made to the benefit fund. He doesn't have an interruption in health care uh, when he moves over to the other contractor. Um, you know, if you want to be truly fair, one could say that, you know, it sounds great having a labor partner. Uh, it sounds amazing that you can have all these workers found for you, but your labor partner doesn't always do as good a job as you'd like them to. So that's something you have to work on. I think the smarts leadership does a great job, but you know, one of the downsides of being a union contractor is you have lost some of that control. Um, you may have picked up enough benefits for that to be a uh, sacrifice you're willing to make or a choice you're willing to make. That's why I really describe it as, you know, it's a set of choices in terms of how you want to run your business. Thank you so much for that explanation. Uh, as I mentioned, my dad is a carpenter, was a carpenter. He just retired. He was a union carpenter. So I'm just picturing him screaming as he listens back to this audio that I just asked a very simple question. <laughs> so I appreciate <laughs> what, you what entertaining local, you me. Where he was from? Oh, gosh. Or where, where, no, where did you grow up? That's a better I grew up, in, uh, I grew up in Flushing, Queens. Excellent. So he's part of the New York City local, which is the mm -hmm. one carpenter's local in the Northeast I really didn't work with. But I had some friends in there, so. 
I was like, I could go to my bedroom and get like an old sleep shirt that has his lo- local number on it and tell you, <laughs> but that's, that's, that's all I know. Anyway, fun aside, you were talking about mega projects. So I want to know a little bit about how you and the SMACNA team help contractors manage these mega, mega projects. So there's a lot there, you know, there are an extraordinarily large number, somewhere between 40 and 50 mega projects on the horizon in the next, you know, three to seven years or, or some time frame like that. Not all of those projects will happen. Not all of them will have the workforce projections they say they're going to have. But the fact of the matter is, is they're all market changing. So, for instance, uh, the Blue Oval Project in Tennessee, um, which is, you know, kind of on the western side of Tennessee, um, that project will likely employ somewhere between 750 and 1,000 sheet metal workers, and there's probably union and non-union collectively about four or 500 in that area. So you're talking about dropping projects in areas where in many cases there isn't a particularly large workforce, or if there is a large workforce in an area, what does it do to that particular market? So from the union contractor's perspective, as well as um, SMART, the, the union we work with, you know, we are concerned about actually losing markets. You know, it's wonderful to go staff these projects. It's amazing to get all these workers on one project and, and even on a series of those projects. But if you do though, if you do that and you don't actually hire enough other workers or find enough workers, you actually lose the customers you already have. Um, and those are opportunities for perhaps the other side to gain market share or competitors to gain market share. Um, but we've seen it in many different markets where it had a mega project that perhaps all the trades were on. Uh, and that mega project ends and then you have all these workers that don't really know what to do and the travelers go back home and you've got to figure that out. So the number one thing that SmackDown and Smart is working on is how do we staff these things? You know, we have contractors who have made substantial investments, um, not just in, in bidding these jobs and getting ready to do them, but, you know, in some cases they've built shops next to them and they've got, you know, manufacturing facilities where they have to find 30, 40, 50, 60 workers and those workers don't exist in that community. And you can't, you're not going to be, we and they are not going to be successful if we steal those workers from, you know, Cleveland, Pittsburgh, or Pittsburgh and Rochester and Buffalo and all the other cities that people might travel from. Um, so we got a lot on our hands to play with. Wow. That's so interesting. Because, yeah, when you talk about bidding for these massive projects, you win a contract, you plan, you know, the next several years based on we're going to have all of this work coming, but that that labor problem that I talk about all the time on the show with uh, non-union contractors, but having to balance that with, okay, we can filter people in, but how can we do it in such a way that we're not completely upsetting this new market we're going into and not to stabilize the one that these workers are leaving. That's what it sounds like. Yeah, it is. And, you know, it's, it's interesting at some level that, you know, a large number of these projects will have project labor agreements on them. And, you know, the reason they have project labor agreements on them is they know that the union side can uh, can staff them. That sounds lovely, but if you staff them at the expense of the market you already have, you've actually hurt yourself long term, not made yourself stronger. Um, so we really appreciate the support those large manufacturers are providing the trades. Um, but we have to make sure we don't actually hurt each other, hurt ourselves as we staff those projects, which we will be able to do. You know, the labor problems that you've talked about on this podcast with other people, they're very real. I mean, the pandemic certainly didn't help that. It accelerated retirements that we already knew were coming from the baby boomers. And, you know, the extent to which the generations that follow were slightly smaller means you have less people competing for those jobs or wanting those jobs. And our immigration system's a mess, so we probably aren't bringing in, you know, workers that would actually take them uh, from other countries. And if, if you look at the history of construction trade unions, but also the construction industry, broadly speaking, you know, they were waves of immigrants who built this country. It was the Germans, the Irish, the Italians um, that, you know, populated unions, and those are the easiest things to track, but it's true for the non-union sector as well, um, that brought their skills from whatever country they came to and then joined the industry because they needed jobs and then moved out of that industry as they got different jobs or, you know, moved into other industries. So, and we need some level of rational immigration policy to start filling this workforce up again, which is certainly hard to do in this political climate. Oh my goodness. I just want to tell you, we've only been talking for a handful of minutes, but the more and more you talk, the more I'm like, oh, his political background probably is really coming in handy (laughs) in the running of SMACNA. Uh, This has been, you know, I would say the last year for SMACNA as as well as, you know, a number of the trade associations, but certainly for SMACNA uh, has probably been, um, from a legislative and regulatory perspective, um, the most productive year that I certainly recall in 20 or 30 years of paying attention. 
Um, you know, some of that I'll give a lot of credit to uh, Stan Colby and his partner, uh, Dana Thompson. And Dana actually retired in, in July of this year. But, you know, Stan has been working on some of these issues for more than 30 years. And, you know, that ranges from, you know, calculating Davis-Bacon in a stronger, better, more rational way to, you know, encouraging 179D and the various tax credit programs that allow people to make better decisions about the projects that they're building or, to, you know, getting funding in, in, in the infrastructure acts. All that stuff are things that SMACNA has worked on and we are working on to this day. So it's a lot of fun, actually. That's awesome. It does sound really fun. I'm going to hop around a little bit. I hope you don't mind because this That's is just right. something that is so prominent in the industry, union, non-union, but in terms of find, filling up that workforce and finding people to fill those vacant spots from these early, early retirements from pandemic, you're looking at generations that are smaller than what the boomers were. You're dealing with some immigration issues that's prohibiting you from uh, putting new people in this country into these roles that they've historically occupied before. So when you're looking at getting more workers and getting more people into the trades, what are you thinking about? So the, the one thing you didn't list in there was, I think, probably the biggest flaw, which is what does K-12 education look like and how is K-12 education rewarded? So if you're a high school principal or a superintendent, um, you're not rewarded when a kid goes into an apprenticeship program or gets a job in the trades, union or non-union. That isn't that isn't considered a, a plus or a good check mark, and you get you get a win. You know, we report on X number of kids, X percent of kids went to a four-year college or a two-year college or in the military because this military is okay. Uh, but we don't talk about, you know, someone joining a four-year apprenticeship program where they actually get paid to work the whole time uh, and don't incur any college debt. Now, I, I have a bachelor's degree and two master's degrees. I'm the poster child of someone who is successful because of learning. So I don't want to come across negative in any way about that path. Um, but I think we can make stronger, better, rational choices in education if we align the incentives a little bit. Uh, and going back to the broader part of your question, you know, I think there's a lot of things that the industry has done to illustrate that construction is a lot more interesting of a career and has a lot more path than people think it does. They, you know, they think it's a bunch of, you know, big, strong, dirty guys out in a job site working all day and breaking their bodies. That is sure. There's aspects of construction that are hard and everything's heavy and the work's really difficult and it's hot in the summer and cold in the winter. And, you know, there's elemental things you have to deal with. Um, and then there's a tremendous number of paths around that and through that. And, you know, you can become a highly skilled worker who's an electrician or a, a HVAC or a plumber. And you could be a fantastic carpenter and have an amazing living. You can become an estimator, project manager, superintendent. You can own a company. All those things are possible. And if I had to, I don't have data on it, but if I had to guess, the vast majority of our SMACNA members uh, we're started by someone who started in the trades and learned how to you know, be a good tradesman of whatever trade they started in and then became a contractor and then survived being a contractor. So the path is, I think, quite extraordinary. We just have to tell that story. Um, we also need to work to show kids that, you know, there are things, you know, in a contractor's shop or operations that are a lot of fun. So you've seen, I'm sure, Angie Simon and her work with the heavy metal summer experience where we bring in, you know, kids to do you know, they build projects, they create things in a, in a shop from, you know, drawing it to learning how to be safe to then actually building the darn thing. Um, that creates excitement. And, you know, some of those kids get a job right away. So those kinds of things yeah. are a lot of fun. Yeah, I keep hearing this over. I thank you so much for indulging me. I keep hearing this answer all the time, especially in terms of the K through 12 element. Like, how do we make the trades cool again? How do we help one another in terms of correcting this false narrative that blue collar work isn't legitimate work that's somehow manifested in at least the years since I've been alive. Um, yeah. And I think it's just really important to constantly reinforce that message and see, you know, over time, how can we all work together to elevate the trades as a whole? So we're right on the same page, you and I. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree. Cause I, I think we've done, we've done a lot of people a real disservice, you know, and, you know, I, I love education. I like learning. I think learning is great. But, you know, we said go get a degree in whatever topic the degree is, and then, you know, they're out working in fast food or at Starbucks, and there's nothing wrong with working at Starbucks, certainly, but they probably could have worked with Starb at Starbucks or in the fast food without it. So the question becomes, did we need to incur that debt, and how do we encourage smarter, better choices for people to have, quite frankly, better careers? Yeah, and you know, I and I'm a. We didn't touch on this, but I'm a. I'm a dad of triplets that are seniors in high school, um, and we are in the middle of the you know let's go to college experience, which I've got to tell you is everything you're thinking about when you think there's three at once doing it. 
Um, and then of course I keep the kid, the background, you know, here I preach the trades the whole time and you know, none of mine want to go in the trades. But... <laughs> well, maybe they'll follow your path. They'll, they'll get several degrees first and then they'll go back to it. You, you never know. That's certainly possible. You never know. All right. So let's go back to project management here at Service Titan. We are really focused right now on how to create software and and automate processes that make project management more effic- uh, effective for contractors, more efficient, more profitable. So what are some of your best tips for running efficient and profitable projects? Um, well, I think there's a, there's a number of different things, but I'll, I'll start with... Uh, using technology, which would probably be number you know, four or five on my list of things that I think about when I start giving advice. But um, one of the things that our contractors have to do is actually learn how to use technology and embrace it, not just spend a bunch of money on it, buy it, and then pretend to use it, and then complain about how much they spent on it, because God knows we've all done that a few times. Sure. Um, and I think you see that need um, reflected in things like Smackness product show or Nika's or MCA's product shows. You know, the number of, you know, great partners like Service Titan that are at those programs have has increased dramatically over the years. Uh, and that's in part because we have better access to information, the ability to capture more information. And then we're all we're all still figuring out how to use that information. So your your more successful contractors have found a partner like Service Titan to help them figure that out and, and work their way through it. And, you know, I'm not, I can't say that I can endorse I, I have. I was in construction 20 years ago, so this stuff didn't exist at all. So I'm not, you know, I didn't get to use it on day one. Um, I'd love to say that we would have used it well. I'm sure we would have struggled with it like everyone else, but I think it would have been a neat thing to watch my father and my grandfather uh, transition into better technology. And I think they would have fought it kicking and streaming, which I find hilarious because they were probably the first you know, people in my small town to have a cell phone in their truck. And they probably had some of the first, I think they were TRS 80s, um, the old little junky computers that were, you know, floating around in their offices, right? And they were writing programs about how to estimate. So we, I think, had this culture of embracing technology and construction, and then we kind of lost it. And now we're refining it again. So I think that's fascinating. Um, I think the biggest things, though, in terms of running projects um, are actually more strategic decisions. You know, the first one is knowing what size you ought to be. You know, a lot of people want to grow every year and they want to grow just to grow. Uh, but you might be really profitable at $12 million a year in construction and lose your rear end at $20 million. So having an understanding of what your actual capabilities are and then bidding accordingly, I think, is very important in terms of how you run your business. Um, I've seen a lot of firms spectacularly fail when they grew too much or grew too fast. Uh, I've also seen those same firms realize that, not cut their overhead quickly enough as they try to get smaller and also fail. So you really need to be mindful of you know what your size is and what the size you want to be. And then related to that are what are the types of projects that you're really good at? What should you be specializing in? What are the things that, you know, as a company have the best profit margin that you have the right staff to do that you're actually really strong at completing and getting, you know, getting through the last 10% of the project and getting paid? Mm. Um, the third item, which falls in the strategic category is knowing who your partners ought to be. You know, are you bidding to every general contractor? Are you bidding to every construction manager? Or are you bidding to the ones that you actually get to run good projects with? And those projects are profitable. Now, re- recognizing sometimes in the low bid universe, you need to get the project you need to get. Um, but if you know that, you know, one company that you've done 10 projects with them and every single time you've lost your bottom, then maybe you should not bid to that firm any longer. Or if you do, you should bid with a much higher number. And if you've got another partner that you've worked with and you've done 10 projects and nine out of the 10 were fantastic and the last one was kind of, eh, well, guess what? You should probably bid more often, maybe a little more aggressively to that guy. So you make some, you know, your, I think your start about good project management is making the right choices as to what your company ought to be doing and who it ought to be doing with. Uh, and then you follow that up with good technology, good training of your people, empowering people at lower levels to make decisions about projects. If they see something going wrong, to be able to fix it. And then having some level of early warning system or management oversight so you get in front of a project that's going south. So I guess the last okay. item I would say is um, when I was a contractor and, you know, in more than 20 years of, you know, being an association person, um, the farther the contractor is away from their money, the more difficult that project is. 
if there's a program manager, a construction manager, a GC, a sub, and you're the sub sub, you're four or five steps away from getting paid, which means mm -hmm. your risk is probably a little bit higher unless they're all really great contractors who you have a wonderful relationship with. So those are things to think about. Very much so. So this is just really fascinating for me because I've been so focused on the, the well, not only the non-union side, but also the residential service and replacement, which has the COD, you know, cash on delivery. Mm -hmm. And you don't really get into this account receivables area where a lot of, I'm, assur I'm assuming, uh, SMACNA members are a part of. And yep. I was just thinking about how, as you grow within the construction business, you can how you should be running your data in certain ways to be able to know which contractor should I be working for? What types of jobs am I most profitable on? Um, and which ones historically have proven most successful. And the second point I, that I loved that you said is just because you're 20 million doesn't mean you're more profitable than when you were at 12 million. And it's up to you to really keep to like, to track that growth really strategically to make sure that you're not overextending yourself for this big revenue number that at the end is probably may just be bleeding you dry. Yeah, I was actually with a contractor last week and we were having this discussion and, you know, he shared rough numbers uh, with, you know, one group they did 22 and one year they did 20 and, but the real sweet spot is 12 because as they went up, they didn't necessarily make more, make enough to justify the extra risk. And if they stay in that, you know, 10 to 15 range, they're in a really good spot for their business with their staffing and the size they are. Because every time you grow, you've got to add layers. You've got to add more people. You've got to add more supervision. You've got to have more. You've got to have more field people who can do the work. You're presuming those field people are as good as the ones you already have. Um, a lot of our contractors in SMAC that do service. Uh, it's primarily commercial service, some new residential, um, but your risk profiles in those markets are very different. You know, if a residential service project goes really south, the person doesn't pay a two, three, five, maybe 10 grand is what you're really at risk for. If a $10 million construction project con contract goes south, it's a much bigger risk profile and a bigger structure to deal with. Sure. Which you should be equi equipped to do. Otherwise you shouldn't be bidding that job, but that's a, <laughs> that's a whole other conversation. Yeah. So it's really interesting, the 22, 20 mil versus 12 million. Is there a particular sweet spot you see for most successful construction contractors that are bidding on, you know, big, high risk, high reward jobs uh, that you just see in terms of a pattern? Or is it really just relevant to who's running the business, where are they located, what their specialty is? And it's kind of hard to nail down a, a number. I, I don't think um, there's no one size fits all answer to that question. So I think it, it does depend on who the contractor is, what their experience is. You are seeing more firms, you can call it a trend if you'd like, doing things like partnering on large projects, finding, you know, like-minded contractors they can share the work and the risk and the reward with. Um, I think that's very smart, particularly as you talk about some of these mega projects, because that can, you know, those can tie up your entire capacity of your firm for a very long period of time. And if you do it by yourself, and that may not be the right bet from a long-term uh, success strategy for your company. Got it. So I want to say that a lot of folks that have come on this show who are owners of residential service and replacement shops, when I asked them what allowed, what was like the one thing that you did that allowed you to grow to where you're at? I'm going to say like, maybe like six out of 10 times, I say, oh, we dropped all commercial, all new construction. And we just focused on residential service and replacement. You're smiling. So I'm assuming you've, you, you know what I'm talking about. I wonder as someone who works for SMACNA, who's been in the construction space, what would you say to someone telling you that, or what are, maybe you wouldn't say it, but what would be something that you were thinking uh, if you heard of a contractor who attempted construction uh, a commercial and I'm lumping them together, let me know if I shouldn't yeah. be. Um, and they end up just, you know what, you know, they, they uncle and they just move to residential service and replacement. What do you think they could have done better to make those yeah. element, those areas more profitable and more successful for them? So I, I would start with what I said earlier, which is you ought to know what you're good at and what you're not good at. Um, and one of the things I have seen over the years with residential contractors, um, and this, I don't mean this to sound negative if it does come across negative, is uh, many of them think they're big contractors. They do five houses a year or they have three or four service guys and they're a big contractor. Uh, and in reality, your larger contractors, you know, do their entire annual sales volume on Monday of the first day of the year. So there's just, you're, you're like an apple and an orange. You're in two different markets, two different universes. 
in the residential sector, yeah, there's building code, there's other things you're aware of, but there generally speaking is no spec book. There isn't a set of plans. You know, you're showing up doing service work and you're all self-guided. Uh, if you're doing larger commercial work or commercial work in general, there's a spec book and a set of plans and, you know, a whole set of rules you have to follow to it, follow along with. It isn't, hey, this is how I feel like doing it. I'm going to go do it, which is probably the the number one headspace difference between those two markets. Now, to be absolutely fair, you know, the new build market, uh, large home market obviously looks a little more like like commercial than, you know, residential service, right? So there, you are building things to spec. You have a, you know, a list of a set of plans and a spec book. It may not be quite as evolved as the commercial stuff. You may not have to meet the same standards, but you do have the same sort of process to follow. Um, so for what that's worth, I think it's really understanding what's different about the market going into it. And just because you're good in one market doesn't mean you're going to be good in the next market. You could be good in the next market if you put mm. the same level of effort and attention to becoming good on it and don't presume that that skill set from one goes right over to the other. Thank you so much for indulging my questions about this because I'm just learning. I'm learning as well. So I so appreciate this. I have a few more questions that I want to ask you. Uh, just okay. take a little bit more of your time. But before we even move on, anything that we should have talked about that we didn't talk about yet about project management and what contractors who are taking on these big projects should be thinking about? Um, I think one of the things that I've seen some firms do it really well and I've seen some not do it really well is that um, we sometimes think when someone starts in the industry, um, they've learned everything they need to know. They're a journeyman out of the apprenticeship program. They've been a project manager for 10 or 20 years or they've done you know whatever they've done. If you're not reinvesting in your people, if you're not sending them to programs about how to be a better project manager or run the business better or paying attention to that, you're probably not running your company as well as you could. Um, we often think that we should be paying attention to field staff and making sure field staff learn things, um, but we're not necessarily sending our junior PM to the Project Managers Institute, or which is a program that SMACTA runs, or to Business Management University. Maybe we send the junior vice president to that, but the, that's great. But maybe someone else, maybe three other people who you're thinking of making a vice president ought to go to that kind of program as well. So if you're reinvesting in your people, one, you're, you're showing them you want them to stay, which helps your retention and other things. You're building, helping them build a great place to work. And two, you're giving them the tools to make you be more successful. And I think a lot of times, you know, especially because we live in a low bid industry in many cases where you need to be the cheapest provider, not the best provider, which is a something I'd love to change at times. Um, we fail to make those investments and that you know prevents us from being better contractors. So given you, what you just said about how important it is to reinvest back in your team, not just the field staff, but also your junior project managers, the people that really are on that managerial side, what are some things that SMACNA offers that enables um, contractors to send their folks uh, to different places to network, to learn? What does that look like? Sure. So SMACNA has uh, historically had a, a number of uh, really strong programs, and I I've been to several of them, not all of them. So I can't certainly apply in person in all of them, but I've heard good feedback on them. Uh, there's a whole project managers track called Project Managers Institute and Advanced Project Managers that is very strong. Uh, there's a business management university program, which is a, a week, seven day program that is, I think, very interesting. A financial boot camp, which is very good for even the non people, the non financial people because they start getting a better understanding of the cash, the dollars and cents that, that flow through projects. Um, those, that group has been sort of the traditional ones that we've done every year. We're actually in the middle of expanding that programming. Um, some of that expansion will be things we develop ourselves or we develop with strong partners uh, like our associate members. Um, the other things I'm excited about are you know, the things we can do jointly with NECA and MCA. Um, the MEP Tech Conference is a good example of that. Um, we are as a series group of members, and there's about 30% overlap between SMACNA and MCAA from our perspective, um, a little bit, obviously less overlap with NECA. Um, our members are on the same projects every day, all the time. Um, we actually benefit, uh, when we're learning things together and our people are experiencing things together. So, you know, doing the MEP conference jointly means that, you know, we're going to have probably five, 550 contractors there this year. And this is one of those conferences that I think will be a, perhaps a thousand member uh, program in a few years as it grows and our hotel uh, room blocks are able to get bigger. 
Um, but they're going to sit and look at, you know, different providers of technology on day one. They get to see actual demos. That was a request coming out of last year that, you know, Service Titan might do or Procore might do or the Alphabet Soup of, you know, Autodesk Construction Cloud or whatever they want to look at. They're actually going to see how those programs work. And then there's another day and a half of content uh, in the tech space to add thought leadership to the discussion as well as a product show. So I think there's a lot of benefit to, you know, learning with your peers and who you're going to work with on the job sites. And then actually maybe people make some of the same investments too. So your systems actually work better together. So I'm actually really excited um, over the next year to expand SMACNA's uh, educational offerings. You know, we've traditionally heavily resourced our labor department, our technical standards department, and our government relations department. So we're now we're adding some resources to education. I love that. And I think the financial um, course, not just for the finance people, so important. You know, while I think the type of work that residential contractors, which historically is who I've focused on uh, with this podcast before, and then commercial construction contractors, there's a lot of overlap in the themes that are really important. Making sure that your teammates know, you know, how the financials actually work, what makes you profitable, getting other folks excited about the trades, being champions for the trades. So while the work is very different and how you know the meat is made so to speak is very different like the a lot of the common issues are shared amongst those different types of contractors so i'm so happy we had yeah, this conversation we're, we're all in the construction industry me. so the those problems are shared problems we're com competing for the same workers uh in some way shape or form right if there's a X number of people that want to be a construction worker, well, then the individual trades or disciplines are competing for those workers and all the contractors then are competing for those workers, depending on, you know, where they are and, and what they need. So um, I think we often overvalue our differences and undervalue our similarities uh, when we talk about the industry as a whole. They are separate in some ways and distinct and, you know, residential and commercial are very different in terms of the rules and how things operate. Um, just like some of the work the non-union sector does looks very different from some of the work the union sector does. And heavy industrial work is very different than architectural work, right? But you're still trying to find and solve many of the same problems. Wonderful way to put a button on this episode, Aaron. I have really enjoyed our conversation. I've got one final question for you, which is my favorite question of all. If you had to choose a song to be the soundtrack of your life, what would it be? You know, that is a, a really, really good one. And I bounced all over that one when I saw that on your list of things to think about. Um, and my first thought was not a song, actually. It was uh, it came from our convention because we had Frank Caliendo there and he does those funny voices and things like that. And, you know, one of his bits was having Morgan Freeman narrate your life. So I think having Morgan Freeman sitting behind me and saying, and this is when Aaron thought this was a good idea or a bad idea or whatever would be hilariously funny. Uh, and then I defaulted to, well, you know, I'm fiercely independent and, you know, always done lots of these things. So Frank Sinatra's My Way certainly would fit in there as a theme song. But that seems a little cliche. So, but I probably, you know, could end there pretty easily. And then I'm a classic rock guy. And then I kind of self-destructed because there's too much music that I like. So if you wanted to take the entire soundtracks of like, you know, the Eagles and Fleetwood Mac and Creed and Clearwater Revival and a bunch of others and just start, you know, just hit go on random, I'd probably be pretty happy too. So I'm not sure I really answered your question there, but I had a lot of fun thinking about it. Well, I'm glad you had fun thinking about it. That's why it's in there. I got to humanize all of my, all of yeah. my contracting guests. Not that you're not humanized already, but I love that. I love answering. I love asking that question. And I thought your answer was fantastic. Aaron Hilger, thank you so much for coming on to Toolbox for the Trades, telling me a bit about SMACNA, best practices for projects. I really enjoyed ch uh, chatting with you. I love chatting with you. Well, look, look forward to doing it again sometime.